Hello, my darlings. <laughs> I have my teeth in. Everything's good. But I just decided we'll keep looking at the window. Chapter 16 of Tracks and Flashbacks. Excuse me. Luckily, there's no shortage of seedy motels in a booming metropolis like Phoenix. Or possibly it's a megalopolis. <laughs> I remember learning that word in seventh grade civics, but I'm not 100% clear on what the word means. Our new accommodations would be thrilled to receive a one-star rating. The carpet is stained. The room smells of a cornucopia of unpleasantness. The bathroom mirror has been removed and the toilet has no lid. There's a seat, thank goodness, but no lid. But the true highlight is in the cleverness of their non-smoking room. Allow me to explain. <laughs> An overturned ashtray perches on the bedside table. On its base is a faded picture of a cigarette marked by a bold red circle with a line through it. So if you follow me right side up, ashtray equals smoking room. Upside down, glass disc equals non-smoking room. It's so simple, blurb. I couldn't stay in that. I'm sorry. I'm too bougie. After we unpack, Eric makes a food and water run while I sort through the remaining evidence. Before he returns, I'll take advantage of my solitude and call Silas. Voicemail? Weird. I can't remember a time when Silas didn't answer his phone. My voicemail skills are a little rusty, but I know he'll never stand for a text. Good afternoon, Mr. Willoughby. I don't want Grams to be concerned, but Eric and I have run into some strong opposition. We had to abandon the hotel we were staying at without technically checking out. We're at a new place, which I won't mention, and we have burner phones. I'll leave you the number of this burner phone. I should have it for a few days, barring any additional unforeseen ca ca catastrophes. Also, I used the stone on one of the documents I was reviewing, and it did reveal some very interesting information. Quick question. If I have a first and last name but no additional details, will my pendulum even work in a city this huge? Chances are there's more than one person with this name. Is there any way I can narrow the odds? I hope Grams and Pi are doing all right without me. I sure do miss everyone. Ending the call, I lay the phone on the cracked bedside table. Eric returns with a selection of fast food options. I stare at the array of crinkled bags stained with grease and frown. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Last night it was room service and a selection of delectable treats. Today it's a heart attack in a sack. He pulls out a chair and eeny, meeny, miny mows his selection. His playful attitude brings a smile to my face and I pretend to spin the cylinder on a revolver and select my meal by Russian, via Russian roulette. Did you come across anything new? He grabs extra napkins. Yes, there seems to be a gap in the reports. Maybe Hackett didn't get everything. There's a jump from the reports about the funeral home to the stack mentioning Tiffany and Heidi in Scottsdale, it sounds like they were involved in distribution of illegal substances, but the reports that potentially tied them to the funeral home are missing. There must be a connection, but as of right now, I don't see it. I have an idea, Eric grins. I know that's usually your department, but hear me out. I flourish my hands in his direction. Please enlighten me. Maybe I should go back to the fancy hotel and call Delgado. Delgado. I can tell her about the bullet hole in the door and pretend that you're missing. Maybe she'll give something away. Chewing the inside of my cheek, I tip my head back and forth like a metronome. Maybe, but what if she offers to start looking for me? The first thing she would do is put a tail on you, and that would lead them right back to our new hideout. He wiped some ketchup from his lip. Our hideout. Chuckling, he lobs the plan volley to me. Okay, Moon, what's your idea? I say we dangle a carrot. We tell her that we found some new evidence, but because of an attempt on my life, we want to meet in a public place. 
Then we call her from a series of pay phones until we lead her to the final destination. That way we can track her and make sure she's not followed. Are there still pay phones? Eric raises an eyebrow. Yeah, now that you mention it, how about we pick up a third burner phone and use it for this mission? We lead her on the scavenger hunt and then we ditch it. Eric nods and crosses his arms in a self-satisfied way. I like it. It gives us the upper hand and a chance to see if she sells us out. Let's finish up with this evidence in case it disappears and then head over to see Mr. Hackett in the morning before we set the wheels in motion with Delgado. Sound good? Sounds about as good as it's going to get with our with a tire-slashing, gun-wielding nutcase on her tail. Muffled shouts from the room on our left and the blaring television from the room on our right fill the void in our conversation while we power through the remaining evidence. Cold fast food leftovers serve as our posh dinner and how we should probably address the sleeping situation. We're both sitting on the lumpy queen-size bed, pawing through papers and shoving various fried foods in our mouths. He stretches out on top um, he stretches out on top over the threadbare duvet, head to toe. I sleep on top of the covers. You sleep underneath. Inside, I want to chuckle at his adorable 10-year-old sleepover rules, but on the outside, I play it cool. Sounds good, but don't kick me in the face. He sits up. I would never. Seriously, I'm like a statue when I sleep. I almost always wake up in the same position as when I went to sleep. I knit my brow into a very serious sleep researcher expression and push up my imaginary glasses before pretending to write on my invisible clipboard. Yes, yes, Mr. Harper, except for when you get up to use the restroom in the middle of the night and get back into the wrong bed. Is that the one exception to your statue rule? He laughs and reaches across the bed to steal my jalapeno poppers. You in? Maybe not exactly a statue, but I promise I will not kick you. Extending my hand, I offer a matter-of-fact smile. Deal. He grips my hand. Deal. Without, rela without releasing his hold, he pulls me in for a smooch to seal the deal. Do you hear, Lord, baby Jesus, give me strength? Somehow I have to focus. Until bedtime, we turn on the television for background noise as we trade papers back and forth, sharing bits of possibly useful information. My mood ring flashes with heat, and I instantly look toward the, the television. Turn it up, turn it up. Eric grabs the remote and bumps up the volume. A spokesperson for the hotel claims that no one was injured. The alleged bullet hole in the door is under investigation. This is the first attack of this kind to occur in a five-star hotel in the Phoenix metro area. He taps the volume back down and his shoulders slump. So much for our plan to keep that a secret and let them think you were dead. Whatever, I got out of there alive and they don't know where we are. As far as I'm concerned, that's a win for our side. I say we proceed with our plans for tomorrow. And see if we can get some information about these Scottsdale chicks from Hackett or maybe from Delgado, but I don't want to tip our hand. Eric's mouth is full of fried apple empanada, but he nods supportively. When the harsh morning light blasts through the useless curtains covering our one window, I rub my eyes and look left. My bunkmate is still sound asleep and indeed appears to be in the same position as when he lay down. I check my phone, and there's no return call from Silas. Slipping into the bedroom, I splash a little water on my face and exhale. It's kind of weird about not hearing from Silas, huh? Eric is still sound asleep when I walk into the main room. I grab a water bottle and rehydrate. As I ease myself down onto my side of the bed, I grab a stack of papers and flip through them half-heartedly while staring unrelentingly at my snoozing guy. Rather than the warm, melty tingles that usually accompany my daydreams, a sharp, icy pain stabs my heart. What if I hadn't been standing beside the door? What if he came back to that hotel room and found me dead? 
do I want to risk loving someone if they're just going to be taken away? Why should I risk letting someone love me? I don't ever want to cause anyone the kind of pain I had to endure when my mother was taken from me. But maybe that's what love is. Maybe love is something so powerful that it makes you forget the risk. I stare longingly at Eric's full lips and my tummy finally flip-flops in the good way and my insides feel warm and tingly. Maybe it's time to take the risk. When a loud thud against the left wall of our motel room finally awakens Sheriff Sleepyhead, I'm already dressed and starving for a decent breakfast. I finished going through the new evidence while you were having a lie-in. Maybe it's been back in Arizona. Maybe it was seeing my old home the other night. Or maybe it's reading all these reports about my long-dead mother. But some of her sweet British phrases have been popping to mind un unbidden. He gazes at me and manages a sleepy smile. The wig is growing on me. Eric jumps out of bed and stretches himself awake. Give me two minutes. I shake my head in disbelief. While I'm well aware that men get ready much faster than women, there's no way he can pull this off in two minutes. When I actually hear him turn on the shower, I roll my eyes. This man is dreaming. <laughs> Three seconds later, he's out of the bathroom with a low-slung towel around his waist, flicking a comb through his hair with one hand while he brushes his teeth with the other. Normally, I would be extremely distracted by his exposed torso, but his mind-boggling multitasking has my full attention. He tosses the comb on the counter, rinses his mouth, and scoops up a pile of clothes. I hadn't even seen him lay out the clothes I hadn't even seen him lay out the night before. He disappears into the bathroom and in less than 25 seconds pops back out fully dressed. Did I make it? Did you make what? His shoulders sag and he sighs. You didn't time me? Peals of laughter erupt and I have to hold my stomach as little tears of joy leak out of the corners of my eyes. No, I wasn't timing you, Ricky. He mopes toward the door. Come on, Moon. I saw a greasy spoon around the corner when we were casing this joint. His use of street-tough vernacular brings a fresh wave of giggles as we load into our minivan. <laughs> I glance over my shoulder and muse. That's probably the first non-illicit trist that motel's ever seen. <laughs> and that is all. And that was very short, but that's about all I can do for tonight. So that's it for chapter 16. Good night, you darlings, you. I hope to see you tomorrow, but I may not. Because hopefully my hand, well, I want to see y'all, but I do hope my Hannah makes it tomorrow. Love y'all. Be sweet, don't be ugly. Bye.